okay, you. So we're sat here, this really fantastic room. Now, thinking as I look around this room, is this room an extension of you? Is, is the inside of your head like this room? You tell me. I mean, I, I just do the. I mean, I just do what I do. I don't, I don't think about what I do often. So, um, I suppose you could argue that that is possibly. I mean, I'm, there are elements. I have boxes inside my head that look like this. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> but I've other boxes in my head that look more like that painting, you know, or an empty space. So. I, you know, I have millions of different people inside of me. Yeah, yeah, the quality like this room's got millions of different things inside of it Poss as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm just fascinated by this thing because you've, you're quite multifaceted. You do a lot of things. Yeah. You do a lot of very, very different things. And to me, this room is scapulates that, you know. There's a lot of detail here. There's a lot of religious iconography. There's, like, musical stuff. There's, like, there's a lot of stuff, isn't there, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's quite old-fashioned in that way. But I like that. I like... This is like um, a library study sort of room for me, and it's a great room for writing in, actually, because uh, you're looking for a sort of something. Wherever your eye falls, there's an object that's interesting that can spark a, an idea or, or some, or some, some abstract thing that works in what you're trying to look for. The studio I've got in Spain... Um, there's a picture of it on the wall. It's a total antithesis to this. There's no shelves. It's all white, modernist, a bit Moorish. It's just a blank canvas. So I like spaces like that too. Well, is, that, is that a deliberate thing then, to uh, maybe concentrate on one project at once when you go there? Or? I think with the studio, it was just, I think in the 90s and 80s, studios had this kind of... It's almost blank, bland, neutral look. I was actually... Uh, they don't have that now. You look at uh, Strong Room, they're all sort of shrined up and, with deck, you know, Jamie Reed paintings on the wall. A lot of studios are like private members' drinking clubs now. Uh, in the 90s, I, I used to go into Olympic and I'd bring in, um, you know, Indian hangings and... You know, get the old uh, staple gun out. Create an environment. It create, yeah. create a space for for me and the band that we're bringing in. Put flowers out there, oil wheels, smoke machines. Uh, and when that, even when I was just doing mix, uh, and it'd just be me and an engineer, I'd have the lights and the smoke machine, this massive spaceship desk, speakers, and it felt like the best gig I've ever been to. You know, there were just things that kind of triggered my. Um, the, the, an illusion of studios are places. They're not. They're not real places in a sense. That what you create in a studio is a facsimile of a great live performance of a gig. It's an artificial environment. A studio. So um, when we're in a studio, as that gives us a technical control over the elements. But what we're trying to create is an atmosphere where the band are doing the best gig they've ever done. They're performing the song the best they've ever performed it. So sometimes adding these little stage props almost to create a, a slight illusion of it being a performance gig really helps. It helps me when I'm mixing it as well. Other times I want it the other way out. I want a hospital, sterile, blank, aesthetic where it's just the music that creates that atmosphere. And, um, you know, so it's weird in Spain, it's kind of like a blank canvas. I've started making it a bit more personal. There's a few Jimi Hendrix prints and stuff going up now, but I quite like that. Maybe there's a nostalgia for me going back to uh, the 90s Olympic days and that. But I do help think, I, th I think the idea of that was that it just clears your, your, your clutch of your head out and you've got a, a blank canvas there. Whereas, likewise, a room like this can, I have to rearrange and sort this room out regularly, otherwise it becomes a heavy weight and it brings you down into inertia and it's a thin line between a collection like this and being a hoarder, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and all that can and actually sort of 
declutter your mind and distract you from what it is you really need to be doing. So everything in here is here for a purpose, isn't it? This is not, this is not like a lot of stuff just dumped into a room, is it? Everything's been meticulously placed in its no, place. No, it hasn't been. I, it's, this hasn't been interior designed. No, I didn't mean like that, but yeah. when you thought about each item, it's, it's not like you, you come back... Uh, with a bag full of stuff and just chuck it in the back room. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it is like that, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. but it's all stuff I've brought in, all the yeah. gifts or stuff, but um, stuff that I've, uh, I've, I've collected or brought on my travels. I've always been a collector. I used to, I was a train spotter when I was 12, you know. Um, I'm a DJ, I'm a crate digger. I, I You know, it's, it's uh, a part of my uh, condition. To collect, but I have to manage it um, as much. It's the, the whole metaphor being creative is allowing the balance between chaos and order, cup and sword in magic. When you push or when you yield, you can distill it all down to that. Every decision, almost. In creative decisions in the studio, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you can even say about life generally. You know. Um, Order comes out of chaos, I think. Mm. So sometimes I like a little chaos in my life around me like this that clutters and it's just... Uh, it's like, oh, you know, I could just grab this and then you just sink in, flow it. And then the order, the sense and the thing, the, what the meaning comes through it. With art and with music, when you try and be a polinarian and pragmatic and logical and you try and knock on the door and open the door and go, okay, here's, where's my chorus, where's my song, where's the lyric, where's the meaning? It's not there, it's evasive, it's fleeting, it's fickle. You, sometimes you have to approach that sideways, round the back door, um, and, and let go of preconceptions, let go of um, intention in that sense, allow a sort of chaos to occur, and then start finding the meaning and the things that pull out of that and and then that 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 becomes more meaningful I mean other times you can go straight to it I have sometimes and sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and there it is the song and you just bang it down other times it's um it's weird it's something I made a massive inquiry into it because I've been making music for 40 years producing artists for 35 years and it's the big question is, where does this creative uh, spirit come from? Where does the idea of um, the art come from? Well, what is it? Um, is it individual to the person? Are they tapping into a collective unconscious? Uh, is it archetypal? Is it mythological? Uh, is it all those things? How do you, uh, how do you make those uh, amazing events occur every day? rather than just occasionally. Um, how do you begin to master that? Um, so a lot of that is, it can be all those things, um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's just, you've got to somehow, Colin Wilson, the writer, is a, is a great inspiration for me. I've got a lot of his books up there. His whole quest was um, what he called the uh, peak experience um, and, and how people and artists have managed to achieve that. So one of the reasons I'm drawn to that, because that's what we're really trying to get with, with music is, is, and in studios is record these peak moments of creativity, or when we're writing uh, with artists or when we're writing with whatever, we, we want to create a peak experience in the expression, the authenticity. How do you do that? Doing that is kind of what this room's all about. It's all these things sometimes. Triggers to get you to the peak experience. Yeah, um, a, a certain amount of awareness of that, a certain amount of letting go of that. Uh, there's a lot in mythology and archetypes, if Joseph Campbell, anthropologist, he equated the hero archetype with the artist. Most people don't really know what the path of the artist is. It's very ambiguous, it's very mysterious, love it. But he was one of these people through the archetype of the hero tried to map it out. 
there's certain general traits that are going to challenges that the artist will go through, certain things the artist will have to do to realise his genius. Um, and they are equated with the hero idea, it's courage, yeah, there has to be fearlessness, courage. There has to be uh, a certain amount of wounding. Uh, there has to be a certain amount of overcoming um, of that. And these things are archetypal. Uh, artists tend to think of themselves as unique and solitary. They're not. We all tap into various um, almost Orphic-like subconscious. When we're in the flow, it comes through us. It, it's not actually of us. Maybe we can help facilitate that. Maybe we can... Like a conduit. Yes, we can tap into it. Maybe we can imbue it with our own personal stories, which makes it sound unique to us. But the essence of what it is, I, I, I sense, is something we, we tap into. Um, and so I think what I try and push artists to do when I'm talking to students or young assistants here or working with young bands is the idea of being able to commit to the idea of being an artist. Now, there may be a painter, there may be a musician, there may be a singer, a bass player, it doesn't matter. You could stay a musician, just be a bass player all your life, fine, that's, that's what you want to do, that's great. But if you want to be an artist, you know, you're going to have to go into that Orphic zone and you have to commit to that. Um, and that requires a lot of sacrifice and a lot of commitment. You'll be doing that for years and years, you'll get no financial reward, very little, very few people will even, you know, notice it, let alone, you know, appreciate it. Um, you might have to wait 20 years before someone appreciates what you've done. But you will be doing it regardlessly because that's your path. And uh, and that's a, I think that's a noble life to live. And it's a beautiful life. It's a poetic life. It's not just being a musician or a painter. It means you're required to imbue yourself with all the arts, uh, literature, painting, film, everything. Your life will be filled with being in the idea of being inspired so therefore you have to go to challenging work difficult work sometimes uh, and understand what that work is what so you those... do painting as well now i do you? and i'm yeah. a poet and uh, i write and i do lots of uh, different things and all those things inform what i do what people know me for doing which is either playing bass and killing joke or being a producer, you know. How different is your role as a producer than being an artist? Or do you see your role as a producer as being an artist as well? I do, yeah. I think my productions are portraits of the artists I'm working with, really. Um, so you work as a, as a producer in a very different way. There's different ways of being a producer. And there's, a, there's a technical side, a clinical technical side. There's there's a co-writing side as well. But you Sometimes. But I'd imagine, I'm just guessing this, but when you work with a band, you get right in there and kind of help with the creative process as depends. well. Depends. Depends on what I'm needed to do and what I'm asked to do. Um, I'm essentially a writer-producer, but I might be producing bands I'm not writing with, like Jesus and Mary Shane or something like that. And my role then is, might be just be refereeing the brothers on that. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's also helping them realise the vision they have and also hopefully pushing that vision bar up uh, even further and creating a fifth element. I was saying there's a can-do. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes people need the encouragement to take the next step. Absolutely. We all need that. We all need a champion. So my job as a producer is to champion the artist in the studio and help them make the work. Um, that will vary from individual to individual and uh, no real set rules on that. Any one rule will apply with one artist, but won't apply with another artist. And, but essentially what we're all doing as artists is the same thing, I think, um, which is my idea of that is you're trying to get the emotional heart of the work and an authenticity of the experience. So, um, but I mean, and that can cover everything really. But uh, yeah, it's uh, what I'm encouraging and what great artists do is they're, they're interested, they're inspired. My job as a producer is to be inspired and inspire the artists to go even further. Um, so I take it seriously. It's, it can be burdensome at times. But at other times, it's the best job in the world, easily. Because, you know, everything I do um, that I love, which is art, literature, da da da, I can do. Uh, you know, it, we, that time goes back into my own creative work, informs my own work, 
um, and the work I'm doing with other people. And, uh, you know, I can make a living out of that. That's an incredible thing. So when you're working like you're currently working with the young punk bands, you're saying, so yeah. is that role working a band like that quite different than say when you work with Paul McCartney or, or you work with Pink Floyd? Or is it or is it very similar? I know you have different roles with different people, but I'm just kind of yeah. interested. If you work with somebody who's been doing it for 50 years, sold zillions of records, do, do they open the open their guard and just say everyone's different? I mean, they're all different, but obviously more successful established artists have a different dynamic to the young kids who are just coming off the blocks. Not always though, some, often with the successful established artists, they're looking down from a big height of success and established work. Um, I, and, and they're like, how am I ever gonna make something that comes near that? Which makes it much harder for them. Often why those established artists often don't make good records as they get older because they spend too much time looking down. Whereas when you're a 19 year old punk band or young artist, you're, all you're doing is looking up. There's nowhere to look down to. Yeah. yeah. So you it's, don't have the fear, you just... Yeah, it's a different, it's a yeah. different energy. Um, nevertheless, different artists established or not will have different peccadillos or personality traits or issues. Um, you know, and even the same artist over a number of years will have, you know, different periods of their time. You, everyone's different. Every day it's different. Um, you don't know. I, I say this to my young engineer producers that I'm training up here, you know, that they may come in feeling really rough. They may have had a really bad argument with their partner or they, you know, they're a family problem or something. It's, uh, but when you're in the room with them, you think, oh, they're pissed off with me. They're not. They're not even thinking about you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so you, every day will be different. You can't take anything for granted. Um, you may have been working with them for a year and you could do one session with them. It's such a highly sensitised environment. Conversation goes the wrong way or something and the whole session's off, you know, in one word or something. So are you very good at dealing with people? I don't know, you have to ask other people about it. Yeah, that. yeah. But uh, I'm told it... that I'm pretty good. I, 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 I find that ironic because actually um, I find I'm quite a shy person. Um, and uh, maybe one of the reasons I joined a band and did that was to kind of address that. Um, but socially, I get social phobia sometimes of big space. That's ironic. I put on big illegal raves in the 90s. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very social person. I invite, you know, lots of people around to my home and, uh, for, for salon evenings. I put on a festival at my home in, in Spain. But I also am a very private person as well. I, I, I'm a, a mass of dynamic contradictions, I think. I like spending a lot of time on my own. I like being very silent. I like the silence as much as I like the noise. So um, again, like this room, the studio in Spain. Yeah. Uh, quite uh, opposites. Yeah, it's a lot of dichotomy. Dichotomy or paradox theory, I call it. Yeah. But I think, I suspect, I sense, we're all a bit like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, when I was coming through as a producer in the 80s, I was doing already doing lots of different genres of music. And, and in the 80s, it, you were kind of accused of being a bit of a jack of all trade and master of none if you didn't just dedicate to one thing. And even Killing Joke in the band, it, because we weren't just punk or just post-punk or just metal, we kind of mashed it all up. W initially, we were kind of criticised as being a bit fly-by-night for that as well. but. You know, I kind of per, per pioneered and pushed that diversity aspect of production. Um, there are very few producers that worked across those sort of cross genres before what I was doing, I think. And now everyone's doing it. And, and I think the world is, people have woken up to those opportunities. Maybe it was the demise of the tribes helped allow people the internet, allow people into all these other niche worlds. And it suddenly, it didn't matter if you weren't like that all the time, you didn't lose your authenticity for that. Um, you could be passionate about that while you were doing it, as equally passionate about whatever else you were doing. Um, 
didn't need to necessarily negate each other and doesn't. And I think that's, I sense again, that's the world is kind of more like that now than it was then. When that's been fortunate for me because, you know, that's part of the way I am, you well, know. I mean, it could be argued that Killing Joke was the pioneers of this way of thinking. You know, you were playing a lot of black music, you know, funk was in there, uh, dub. And a lot of the riffs are coming off those kind of records and the feel of the sound, but it's played through very intense kind of punk, post-punk kind of vibe. But it's, but it's, but it's a lot of influences all sort of crammed into a type of music that became its own type of music. So in a way, it was your production an extension of that kind of schooling, that kind of grounding that you had in Killing Joke? I don't, I don't know for me to say again. I mean... I think what we did was quite unique in the in the makeup and the mashup of that, and that's not so u unusual today. Um, and obviously, the bands had a huge amount of influence from bands like LCD Sound System to Matanica, you know, um, and Nirvana. That's that's fantastic as well. Um, I don't, but I don't know why that is. I think it's just because we're very different personalities, very strong alpha personalities that have, you know, been confined in a space that just bounce atoms off each other. Um, and we've managed to make it, ho hold it together somehow over the years. Um, is, this, is this where you learn how to deal with diverse people and student well, environments, in, in claustrophobic the, environments? Very good, yeah. very good question. I mean, Killing Joke was my university. For all of us, it was our university, I think. And uh, certainly nothing is harder there's no band harder to work with than Killing Joke. <laughs> Even Guns N' Roses make Killing Joke. Yeah, Killing Joke made everyone else look easy. Yeah. But it, they don't, actually, because in some ways, Killing Joke's the easiest band for me to work with because I know the guys so well. We love each other so much. And sometimes it, we, or we don't even have to discuss it. We just plug in, turn up, and it's there. Um, Whereas, you know, I, but, but certainly the challenging aspect, everybody's very, very challenging in Killing Joke. And, but that's good as well. I'll encourage bands to be challenging if they're being too compliant uh, sometimes. And I'll push them. And I'll, I don't want a vibe in the room that's too nice. Mm. Music's just a great... Uh, music doesn't lie. You know, records, even though it's an artificial line, we creating the illusion with overdubs and stuff of this being a, a performance. You, you can hear that. You can hear that in a Trevor Horn production. It doesn't matter. It sounds great. It's like you can hear that in the Beach Boys. You know that's a production. You know there's illusion that they've edited that. It doesn't matter. It's still an exquisite piece of beauty. And each component part has its soul and and it's beautiful. But there, there still has to be an authenticity there somehow that glues it all together. And, uh, and, and, and then that environment, that artificial environment becomes your instrument, the mixing desk, the studio becomes an instrument and that creates its own you know, context. Dance music is made out of machines, electronic machines that, you know, have no... I'm, yeah, I think those machines do have a spirit and soul, a 303 and 909, as much as a Stradivarius does. Um, and, and any objects, I think, have a, 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 a vibrational energy that is a good vibe or not, you know. Um, so like a digital crystal in a way. But yeah, in a, in very much so. Yeah. Instruments, are, you know, the tonal instruments that create uh, that vibration. It's always fa your career path is so fascinating, the way the Killing Joke thing, obviously. And then famously, you went quite mad at the end of Killing Joke. And then a couple of years later, you start to re-emerge as, as a big producer. I can never work out how you managed to get all that together. There's, there's a pretty insane three or four years in the middle of that. I had my Sid, Sid Barrett moment at 21, burning money on the King's Road in a kimono. Um, that's one of the reasons I wear a kimono now on stage. Oh, is it? To, to, to remind yourself of that? Yeah, or? a little yeah. bit, yeah. Um, a little touchstone to that. That was a very powerful thing for me, even though it was like a massive meltdown, breakdown. I ended up in a mental hospital for two weeks uh, uh, and uh, I went into Sid Barrett, Peter Green, you know, world. But you got back. But I they, managed they, to get yeah. back. Yeah. Um, what got you to that point then? Was it just 
the meltdown. Yeah. I was way too much LSD, mm. you know, uh, a, a flippant, irresponsible consummation over a couple of months. And there was one event where a friend of mine, I bumped into a club, I'd said, if you're a friend of mine, take this. And I said, oh, I'll take acid all the time. I took it. And then I, yeah, he was going through a bad time. I thought he was going to kill me. I ended up hiding in an attic of this club, running out, uh, rescued by a Polish ballet dance. It wasn't so bad. Um, <laughs> but I didn't stop tripping for days and days. And then it slowly came down, really freaked me out. I wrote to his grandmother where I, he was living and said, you can't do that, it's really freaked me out. You know, let's sit, sit down and talk about it. And then I found out he committed suicide uh, a week later. Yeah. And that sort of emotionally plunged me into a deeper abyss of psychedelic. And uh, the doctors later explained to me, I had, uh, that your body creates DMT. It's a very progressive doctor at the time, actually. Um, when you have a, a, a near-death experience, like a car crash, you know, slow motion, everything goes slow motion, that's DMT in your system creating, I don't know exactly why that is, to help you cope with it, I suppose. But the, he explained my, my LSD consumption had been so much, my, even though I'd stopped taking it, my body was creating it because it was used to it or something. And it combined with this emotional breakdown I was having. But it did take me, I don't know, about six years to come through it. I had two mentors, Brian Barrett and uh, the wizard who blew fire with Killing Joe. He'd come and visit me every day in the mental hospital. And they were the only people saying, you're not mad. They said, you're going through this shamanic initiation. You're going to go through these levels and get through this. And then they got me through it, actually. And that... Prior to that experience, I was a very cynical kind of street punk. I, even though Jazz and Paul were very spiritual people, they'd been members of the Golden Dawn at 14. Yeah. I used to just take the piss out of them for it. And I just, you know, um, I was totally agnostic, you know, scientifically based, just didn't believe any of that. But then this, this experience that everything became spiritual, everything became cosmic, everything, it was a complete, you know, revelation. And so that led me to start, you know, it, it was like the fall falling over the cliff. It really woke me up. Um, and then I started taking it seriously and studying shamanic practices, studying the shamanic practices of this island, opening up to spiritual ideas and philosophies, uh, going to India, classic. Was this part of a way of dealing the situation you it was were a way in, of or did it just open the door to find out? It opened the door, and it was also my exploration of what it was I'd gone through. I was trying to understand what had happened to me. Didn't figure in my cosmology what I'd experienced. I was having visions, you know. Um, I was I was tapping into some incredible stuff. I could almost make the street lights go on and off, uh, just freak Geordie out. But <laughs> I. You know, I was tapping into some weird stuff. I still don't understand what that stuff was. Um, I'm still understanding like it. Auras and energies. And... Yeah, just, uh, you know, extraterrestrial stuff, all sorts of stuff. Um, and so I started, I started basically, I really went into Hinduism, Druidry. Um, I chose those pagan uh, practices because... I found they weren't about my will in, in ordering or altering the cosmos. It was more about sinking in with it and flowing with it. Um, so destroying the ego in a way. Well, that LSD had done that. Yeah, yeah. In, in Living the, without the ego now is destroyed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, they'd call it the annihilation of the false ego. And, of course, now that's part of my role with bands, is, is an artist, is... For them to be able to learn to differentiate between the ego that is useful, that gets them up on the stage and helps them push the will, and annihilating the false ego that bullies them and keeps them locked into a, a prison of delusion and, and falseness. So, And you did this by... The, 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 the mad phase, basically. The, uh... Well, I mean, that was an initiation into yeah, yeah. That, I think. And... Uh, uh, and the, and part of that meant I had to leave Killing Joke and start exploring other paths, production, um, experimenting with other music. 
Um, Why did you have to leave Killing Joke then? Because it was... Well, I didn't leave Killing Joke. They left me. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. Yeah. I didn't want to leave. I, but Jazz left first, then Geordie joined him. And me and Paul formed Brilliant. And then Paul went back and joined them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was like, OK. Yeah. There's something, the world's telling me something here. Um, so, so even those guys found you a little too ultra to work with? No, no, they, well, they came, when they came back from Iceland, they were like, Jazz is knocking my door. We've got another German tour. Come on, let's do it. Mm. And I was like, no, take Raven. He'll He'd love to do it. I'm, I, I need to do something else for a bit. And that made me realise that that was probably what I needed to was do. Was that like a practical decision as well? No, I just thought it, 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 it more felt to life. right. It felt yeah. right. And also the third album, Revelations, I thought was a bit dirty and I hadn't been that involved with it. And even though we had the great Connie Plank producing, I thought we were becoming a bit of a self-parody and... Little did I know they were going to go and write the best song we've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> but I love playing that song now. Um, but, yeah, no, it's all part of the process. It's funny, isn't it, with life, serendipity. It's, when you look back in hindsight, even the awful bits of your life make sense to where you're at now. But while you're going through it, you can be like, what? Why me? What's you know what's happening? And is that right or fair? Cool. It's just process. I think you have to trust in in the process, um, and it leads you to where you're supposed to be. And we're always where we're supposed to be. Yeah. You know? Even if it's a bad place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so then you have this like amazing production career. You produce like Crowded House. These are like massive selling pop records. And yeah, I remember people at the time <coughs> thinking that can't be the same guy that was in Killing yeah. Joke. You know. It's, did yeah. you find something inside you that you didn't know that was there, this, this kind of knack of creating great pop records? Um, I didn't know it was there. I mean, if you listen to Killing Joke's first album, all well, the chorus is very pop, actually. And me and Geordie both had a great love of pop, still do. So I think it was always there, but it took a great manager to pull it out of me. And, well, that was Jazz Summers and Tim Parry, and they, they basically said, you're right, a producer. Yeah, I didn't even consider that, even though I'd been producing bands and records for a while. I still saw myself as a songwriter, artist. Um, and they're like, no, you're a writer, producer. And they, you know, they put me in with, and they knew I had a love of pop and I'd done a dance society record for them, actually, that they'd really that had done well, gone to number one on the indie chart. And I'd gone to them to ask them if they'd help me find a singer for my next band after Brilliant had, you know, broken up. And, uh, they said, what do you want to do that? You're right, a producer. We've got a singer, but she's not going to be in your band. You're going to produce. And that was Yaz. And that was my first number one, The Only Way Is Up, which I co-produced with Cole Cump. It was amazing. And, uh, and that opened up a lot of opportunities and a lot of potential. And, uh, but then I became known as a dance producer, really, which was great. Dance me, UK dance music was emerging. I kind of got associated with that. At the same time, I was doing the Orb and... Um, my partner in Brilliant, my band after Killing Joke, Jimmy Courty, who started the KLF with Bill Drummond. Bill Drummond had been our manager. There was a bit of a collective going on in South London with the Orb and the KLF. Those were really formative times for us. And um, your history with the Orb goes back to school, and you went to school together. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had Alex here yesterday, actually. And uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's strange. Uh, it, that we've had that journey together. Very rare that anybody would still be working with the same people they worked with when they were teenagers, when they're in the late 50s. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and there's a great reward to that. And that's why I say to bands who don't want to reform that sometimes, you know, if it's challenging, if, if you fear it, you should draw it near in a way because there's something in there for you to learn. and But there's also the, the benefit of doing that is amazing. You can really re-look at all those dynamics you had when you were a teenager, the, the clashes, you can re, um, you can kind of unravel them and un, and, and, and tie up those laces uh, is this, and resolve a lot of stuff. In a sense, is this Killing Joke? Said, well, Killing yeah. Joke and with, for me with Alex. Mm -hmm. Alex is a very contained character. It's very hard to know what's going on with him. I've known him since I was 12. I still, you know, it's hard, you know. Um, same with some members of Killing Joke. But, you know, the, the, the idea of you still working together, having a relation to get together, 
you, you can see that through the lens of perspective time. That's a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. It's a great reward, and I'm very grateful for it. And I remind other artists of that as well. Yeah, it's interesting, because it was for a long time, because I guess because rock music or whatever we want to call it, pop culture, was so young, it's, it's only got older recently. The idea of an older yeah. band was impossible, wasn't it? That's right. But with Killing Joke, it's one of those, there's several, there's a whole raft of bands out of well, like the Stones, you know. yeah. I mean, it's amazing. They, they need uh, a good producer. They do need yeah. a good producer. I mean, they've got a good <laughs> yeah. producer. Don Was is a great producer. He's great, yeah, but, but they need someone close to home. I, I yeah. think they could do with uh, something a little more uh, edgy. Um, uh, a little push. Uh, yeah. I'd love to work with them, I must admit. And uh, But I don't know if I'll ever get asked to do that. But, yeah, one of the greatest bands and still formidable energy, live, ridiculous. Mm. And the groove, they have that swing, don't they? Oh, which... yeah, Charlie, amazing. Well, or the yeah. way they all slightly play out of time with yeah, each other is yeah, magical. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's loose, it's great, but it's got soul, you know. And But it's right on it as well, actually, you know. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Working with Paul McCartney must have been an interesting experience. Amazing, yeah, peak experience, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, when, when you were younger, like, before the punk, before punk, I mean, I know you were into, like, a lot of disco music and dance music, yeah. but were the Beatles, like, oh, a talisman band? Probably the first big one, yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, Sergeant Peppers, my dad, brought that back when I was six, seven. 1966, it was, wasn't it? So how come your dad had it? Was he? I mean, I know your mother was actually a model, wasn't she? My mum was a model in the 60s, yeah. drove a Mini Cooper S. We were living just outside Slough in Stoke Poges. And my dad was a bit fly. He was a bit of a villain, my dad. Mm. And I think at the time he was sort of doing something with washing machine laundrettes or something. But um, he was also in and out of prison, you know. Um, but they were a young, beautiful couple. And uh, it was a great... It was, um, I just remember that the 60s through their eyes was an amazing thing. So they were part of that. They were quite young, weren't they? They were young. They were in their 20s. Um, but... They weren't, they weren't psychedelic, they weren't taking uh, acid, they weren't even smoking pot, they were drinkers. My dad was a drinker. But they'd have a lot of parties, and there were a lot of, I remember these sort of swinging 60s parties, and my mum had these other model friends, and it was glamorous. I remember it being glamorous and interesting, and, and he was, he also worked in advertising, but he was, very, he was an artist, he painted, he made, Jewelry for my mum out of fiberglass and these little casts, and he did all these different things. And he was a great influence um, in that way. Um, and I just, I remember him coming in with Sergeant Peppers one day, record player, they're always playing music. Um, and I just remember drawn to the sleeve, and I, t I took the inner sleeve out, cut out the sergeant stripes, and I started listening to the record. And the record just opened up this three dimensional world of. It was like a movie in your head. Was this, the was this the record that did that? It was, I think. I think it was probably the first one that really pulled me in. Great opener, wasn't it? I mean, tough, though. Tough act to follow, Sergeant Peppers. But I suppose around that year, 66, 67, I'm still really fascinated with... Just read John Savage's book, 66, which is incredible. Um, that whole summer of love, the optimism, the creativity of that short period of time fascinates me. A big part of my agenda with with everything I've done with music, with Kill from Killing Joke to Dragonfly putting on raves, is to try and create a sort of bedrock that allows something like that to happen mm. again. I was thinking that it's almost like you've just never left the party. Well, I never went to the party. I was six oh, is that years where it is? old. Yeah, where is this party? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I just imagined what the party's like now, and I'm like, wow, I wish I could have been. I've got a lot of good friends who who were at that party, and it was as good as I imagined uh, from their accounts. And uh, but we're still feeling the ripples and the resonance of that. Imagine how what the world would be like today if we hadn't had that summer of love. I mean, gosh, it'd be very great. Be very joy division. You know, and that, that's not to say Joy Division as a monochrome counterpoint to that in 77 it wasn't equally beautiful in its own way. Well, I'm, it's a psychedelic record. Yeah, it it's is. It's just a different actually. type of psychedelia. Yeah. I took my yeah. first LSD to Joy Division. We, I remember, it took me a little while to get Joy Division and we were on tour in Germany. I'm di digressing, but this is a good story actually. And, uh, we were driving in our van through the East European corridor to Berlin. 
and it was a completely blue sky. And over Berlin, which was along the straight autobahn at the end of the horizon, was this thundercloud. And I thought, I'm going to get Joy Division today. So I sort of claimed shotgun, sat up front, stuck in unknown pleasures, and took a white lightning LSD tab. And it suddenly all made total sense. And as we were coming into Berlin, you could see little flecks of lightning coming out of the thunderclouds above it. And yet that we were in sunshine in this blue sky. It was a totally surreal experience. A perfect moment. At yeah. One of those absolute perfect moments. It just made complete sense. Um, and after that, I just loved everything they did, really. So that really helped. But... Um, Getting back to the Beatles. <laughs> the Beatles, that album was virtual LSD, I thought. Holding it, I could feel tingles. Listening to it was, took your mind into an, uh, uh, you know, a psychedelic experience. So would you, do you think you had a psychedelic mind before you did psychedelic drugs? I think so, yeah. I think so, because by the time I did start doing psychedelics, it felt like coming home a bit. And I'm a bit of a daydreamer, I'm an artist, and everything was psych... You know, I don't take psychedelics so much. I haven't taken LSD for eight, nine years. Um, but I still feel psychedelic a lot. And I can make myself feel psychedelic through meditation and other things now. Um, and the world becomes more psychedelic. Uh, and psychedelic culture and psychedelic things are... Still really important to me. Would you say psychedelic is actually the main driving force in your music and creativity? Oh, it's certainly a part of it. Um, but uh, I, I don't think it's the beginning or end of that. It, it's, it's, all, it's a dynamic thing, what I do. So it's light and shade and everything. In its in broader between. sense, I don't mean paisley shirts. I mean. I'd uh, like to think a lot of what I do is psychedelic, even if whether it's Banana Rama or Killing Joke. There, there are psych there should be elements in there that elevate and teleport you to other dimensions. There is a stark psychedelic feel to Killing Joke, I would say. I do, when we started, the, a lot of the audience were taking LSD, and I could I'd go out into the audience. There'd always be some guy by the loose going acid speed. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you never hear that these days, do you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you did then, and I always found that encouraging, knowing that the people are actually on the you know, psychedelics while we're playing helped. Well, in a sense, you were, Killing Joke was seen as a post-punk, not a continuation, but a part yeah. two of Hawkwind in a way, you know, from Notting Hill. <laughs> Steady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've worked with Nick Turner as well, haven't you? I so have recently. There's connections. I've I don't mean a copy, know. but I mean um, th that vibe, that space. That there was that a big kind of space. connection with us and Motorhead. We shared a rehearsal room with Motorhead and we tried to compete with the volume of Motorhead. Who won? Uh, Motorhead. <laughs> Possibly. I actually did amp. I ended up having a half a PA stack with a huge bass bin as as my bass stack, which was bigger than Lemmy's. Mm. And I remember because our, our gear would stay in the same room. We just had this room between us, and it would just always be there. And then I could see, I could sense his displeasure once that rig came in. <laughs> <laughs> he can't do that. <laughs> But actually, during my meltdown phase, Lemmy was very, very kind to me and took a lot of time out of him playing, you know, Fruit Machines in the pub. To, he'd take me back to their house off Portobello. We were off Portobello as well and, and try and explain the universe to me. And, uh, you know, and he was, he was, he's got a, he had a very beautiful, kind heart, unlike the other two. <laughs> <laughs> Who just took the piss out of you. <laughs> Oh, they were nasty. I was at a party at Phil Linett's once, and yeah. Filthy Phil punched me. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I was caught with someone else's girlfriend in the bathroom upstairs, some other musician's LA girlfriend. I thought I was... I do, I do remember it, but not much. And um, I don't know, I was a punk, and they were all world rockers, mm -hmm. and it felt to me like they were fed up with the punk storming the... The ramparts, and I'm, I was made an example of. Okay, with that, but not with Lemmy though. So Lemmy was. Lemmy wasn't there. He was in the middle of every single scene. No, no, he, Lemmy yeah. was the, the bridge between the two, actually. Mm. But uh, Filthy Phil, I mean, all of them. 
he was filthy Phil was as well, but they were firm. Phil was firmly on the pub rock side of, you know, than punk, and they were all 10, 15 years older than me easily, mm. you know. But Lina was a, a Lina stopped him beating me up. And and so I think you better go. <laughs> I had to leave. Um, and uh, he was a lovely chap. But the, uh, yeah, I don't know. They were bitter. The other guys, I felt. I mean, they're a fantastic band. But personally, I didn't get on with them at all. I, I just they were very dismissive. Whereas Lemmy actually was generous, a generous spirited guy, and and took time to help me out. He didn't have to help me out. I mean, but he, he, you know, he didn't hesitate. Later on, I found out that he grew up in Anglesey. Uh, my father's family all from Anglesey. Oh, really? Yeah. So there was a connection. Yeah, a I felt psychic a connection. spirit there. Yeah, yeah. To the ancestors or something. Yeah. I don't think he's very fond of Anglesey, but... <laughs> Possibly not, no. He did get out of there, though. Pretty fast. I've yeah. got cousins who never left the island. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. You must have been up there... Would you got then a Druidic kind of connection? Because that was there, the last there is a Druidic. Bastion. Yeah. yeah. I bring Kelly I go to frequently. And that's one of the few circles and chambers where the midwinter solstice sun comes in and illuminates it. Um, and I've actually done that on psychedelics a few times. Uh, be beautiful experience. And, and quite a sort of out of the way circle. It's not that busy, you know. I um, mean, there's the whole island's littered with uh, sites. Very magical, yeah, beautiful. So do you find psychedelics, do you prefer to, when you did take them, was better with music or, or in Anglesey in a, in a situation like that or just different experiences? I, I found, I experimented a lot with, with taking various substances in the studio. I found that very rarely worked. Um, and it was far better to go out into nature, especially with psychedelics, and experience that reconnection. A big part of what those psychedelics do is help you reconnect to the cosmos and the planet and everything. And uh, uh, and that's part of the whole phenomenon of the ayahuasca uh, phenomenon that's happened in the last few years. As part of a general re-awareness of the connection of things and, and the holistic universe sort of idea. And, uh, and you can have absolutely profound experiences out there um, in that way. And it was, it was uh, uh, almost, would guarantee a good trip, or it's kind of scary and challenging as well sometimes, but it, it, it would be a natural I experience, you know. And then you bring this back to the music. Then you have that experience, then you go into the studio a couple of days later and you take that experience into the studio, mm. and that informs the work. But the studio, again, is an artificial environment. You need to be kind of quite sober and focused. I very rarely even drink or encourage people drinking in the studio. It's all tea and spliff, mm. you know. Mm. And um, and that's that, that'll keep you going for days. But alcohol, you, you come up for an hour or so and then you come down. It's the only drug that does that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, nevertheless, some bands, rock and roll bands, they want to have a drink, they want to do something, or doing Primal Scream, and I do, but, you know, get, take it in the loo or something. And, I don't want to see it in here. There's, have a respect for the space as well, you know. Mm. So you're quite disciplined when you work in. Sometimes, sometimes I'm the other way. Yeah, so it's whatever the music suggests. Or yeah, the said context, earlier, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so finally, I just want to get back to when you go back to Killing Joke. And I'm interested in this idea that I was just wondering, did you ever actually leave Killing Joke? <laughs> You know, obviously, obviously, physically, you weren't in the um, band, but... I've had situations, I rejoined... Yeah, yeah, you did a few bits and bobs over the years. I rejoined years. for yeah. Pandemonium, Democracy, and then... But then, I, yeah, there's a couple of times where I found it hard to commit to touring after those albums. Pissed the band off, understandably. Um, but for whatever reason it was, I might have been producing, offered a really big production I couldn't, didn't want to turn down. And I also I always found touring a struggle. I thought, felt a bit of a performing seal on stage sometimes and felt better if other people did it. I always felt my niche was the studio, really. Do you, do you not feel like an actual performer, though? I do, um, but often when I'm not really performing, I'm just sort of standing there playing. And, You're not? No, that's why I used to like taking LSD at gigs. It gave me a bit of a performance. It gave me a light show, you know. <laughs> and I think jazz is a performer. The, but I quite like non-performers like me who just play, you know. No, you, you actually do perform in a sense. I mean, do it's I, not... It's I'm not, not self-aware in that way. I don't know. I, but I know I don't feel very comfortable you on stage. You do that kind of sideways walk across stage and back again. Do I? And that kind of going oh, down and up terrible. again. 
No, it actually works. <laughs> it, it works. It totally works. You, it? You, you're in the groove with the music with your body, which right. is the only way you can perform. Yeah, I kind of do a little nod and bob. I used to not dance at all because if I started dancing, I wouldn't be able to play. It's not so much time. dancing. You just do a sideways crab walk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There was a point in the nineties where I got to be able to play and jump around. I'd jump on the drums and go out and kill. And I was like, you know, I've seen you. That's uh, yeah, crazy, and yeah. I like doing that sometimes. But I don't know. It's like. I do like performing. I'm really looking forward to the tour we're going to do, um, and I'm I, I I enjoy it now. But I still I kind of some often feel like oh this isn't really my true path. My path is in the studio often. So you know I, I've I've had to pull out here and there, and uh, yeah, it's 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 pissed the band off. But uh, otherwise, it's meant to be that enabled Raven to come back in at those points after two thousand and three album was incredible. Um, he he toured that one, and he got to play on a track on that album as well. And that's all part of the family, you know. And yeah, it's fine. I mean, I, I don't know if we could do that without Geordie or Jazz um, in a way. We all like to think that the Killing Joke could continue without us, with other musicians, you know. Mm, so, but, saying that, I mean, I'm, I'm Raven was incredible, great bass player, great yeah. presence. But there's just something about the four of you together that creates. A you do feel it in the room, weird voodoo in the room. It's, I don't know if you feel it on stage, but you definitely feel it in the audience. Well, well, I do. I don't know how they feel with other people. I mean, if we're doing gigs occasionally, we, Paul can't do, we have a, a depth comes in for Paul. Uh, that is often great, but it's not the same. No, so, I mean, I've seen yeah. great players in Killing Joker. Yeah. There's lots of different great players, yeah. but there's just something beyond when you get those four people together. Yeah, I suppose it's the uh, original lineup thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know what that is. It's just a unique, odd, it's a pretty odd chemistry. chemistry. chemistry yeah, 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 it's an overused word, but it definitely, yeah. in that context, it's yeah. definitely there. Yeah, chemistry is important. And is that one that draws you back to it? I mean, you don't really need to do it. You say you don't really like performing that much. I mean, look for no. to tour, etc. but you're <laughs> producing lots and lots of records. You don't need to be, in, I mean, kid joke or big bands, but they're not, yeah. it's, not um, it's not a stadium band, is it? It's, it's, uh, no. We've never been uh, fiscally successful in, in that way, but I, I really, uh, I'm grateful for Killing Joke. I love Killing Joke. I love playing. Uh, Killing Joke still informs what I do in a lot of ways. I love being with those guys. Uh, just, I like being in their company a lot. Um, and I like uh, what Killing Joke brings out of us and myself. Um, Sometimes a lot of things I do with with the work aren't commercially minded. They're more artistically minded, um, and I like to think that's been the the main what the success I managed to achieve has allowed me to do that more. Giving you the space to yeah, do killing joke allows yeah. that to do more of that, um, and that's always been one of the great rewards. Not just killing joke, but other experimental projects would never be commissioned, you know. But often that's where some of the biggest successes come from as well. So I don't know. I just uh, I, certainly none of us really need to do it, but uh, we and it's you know it can become challenging and burdensome for killing joke. We halfway through a tour. It'd be very intense. It's always intense with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, Is that everybody bringing different kinds of intensity into one space? Possibly. I think, yeah, all great work, all great art has an intensity to it, doesn't it? So, again, as a producer, sometimes if the, if the vibe in the room's too nice and smooth, I'll, I'll make it intense somehow. I'll try to engage people into, you know, what we're doing and challenge, make a challenge. Does your role in Killing Joe change then? All our roles change in Killing Joke, weirdly enough. What kind Even of ways? though we basically do what we do, but sometimes one of us will take more of a lead and uh, uh, oversee the whole project, and others will step back. And other times, you know, you know, different things. We will do different things. More people. Some people write more on one album than another album, and you know, it's uh, it's it is shifting. Um, but I've always had a little angle on overseeing the management, the business side of things. Although we've got great management now, um, I still get quite involved in how we get the production of the work done and the, 
working with the designers, with Mike Coles, and discussing ideas, details. We all get involved in that to a degree, although some of us don't almost at all. But everyone has an opinion by the end of it. But I'm, I quite enjoy the whole machinations of that and uh, getting involved. In that. But there are times where I step away from that as well. And Geordie takes that role or something. Or is, it, is it like an instinctive thing where somebody just feels the other person's hot, they've got the ideas, just let them get on with it? Or is it, or is it a lot of pushing? It's and... not a democracy killing joke. It's, um, it's not even a merit... It is a bit of a meritocracy. So whoever's idea is the best idea, that's the idea we're going to go with. And, uh, and it's usually an unanimous thing. But it, no one has a kind of prerogative right to that. But that's what makes it interesting, uh, I think. And then that allows us all to kind of um, really throw in some, some radical ideas. Uh, but it, just the personalities in the room together tends to create enough, you know, things start pinging off, atoms bouncing. When, when you go into the room, do, the, do you go back into that role of being the person in Killing Joke, you know? So, or, you know, does jazz stop being the classical composer and go back into being jazz? Or do you bring bits and mixture of these things in? It's, I would discuss with, with jazz often, I'll say that in some ways, the, the archetypal dynamics of us don't change, not an atom. And other things, loads of things change. But it's like that, um, that old sort of saying, you know, you, you, you have to, Find the wisdom in life to change the things you can about yourself and accept the things you can't. And if you can do that, that's that's wisdom some, somehow, you know. And that's a great metaphor for that, being in a band and, and growing with people like that. But, the, you know, all bands are like families and all families are psychotic. And they're psychotic because you lose your individuation when you go into the family group. And suddenly it's not just about what you want to do and what, where you want to go. You have to work within the group. And that drives people crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why those groups and families are always psychotic and because they always have that dynamic of loss. But you need the community. And ultimately, what we've all been talking about, it comes back to the C word, the community bringing people together, first of all as a band, as a family and creating that, and then they bring in an audience and those, bring, you know, and that it's all about bringing people together and us finding our commonality, sharing our experiences through, or thinking the same thing while we're experiencing that and, and getting the renewal and the inspiration from that to, remain human and go on with our lives. And that's what brings you back to Killing Joke, brings the audience back to the gigs, the whole thing. It's, yeah, it's, it makes it's it like real, totally yeah. unique. There's something there in that room that yeah. feels different from but other that's situations. that's what all bands do, essentially. That, that's what we all love about it, is uh, music brings people together. You know, it helps, uh, uh, it helps us uh, bond. It helps us... It reinforces friendships. It re it creates new friendships. It helps bond old friendships. It, it's the glue that brings it all together and makes us sh human, you know. It's a great point to end on. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> Perfect. Kiss <laughs> offline, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah.